So, um, hello everyone. Uh, for people who are joining uh, late before the announcement, uh, today's class is entirely crowdsourced. By crowdsourced, I mean I don't really have anything to say, and you will have to tell me what I have to speak about. If we run out of question here, uh, we all get back home early, but that never really happened. In any case, um, if you have a phone or any internet connecting device, uh, please open your browser and go to Slido, S-L-I-D-O.com, and enter today's date uh, with a zero before it, so it's a zero one zero oh, one two zero one zero one two. And once you're in there, there this is a, a chat room that is anonymous. Um, although I do see people actually identifying the, themselves like very consistently. Uh, we also in, see very interesting questions like this one, uh, which is probably anonymous for a very good reason. So by uh, keeping it a opt-in uh, venue, people can ask very challenging questions uh, using anonymous accounts, as well as if you want uh, to identify yourself. So it's an option that everybody can use. And if you see a question that you would also like to see me answer, you just press like. And the idea is that a question with more like will flow to the top. And I will uh, just answer the ones uh, based on the order of the likes here. And if you don't have a phone or you, if you don't have an internet connecting device, you have two options. One is that you can ask the people sitting next to you to enter your question for you. Or you can raise your hand at any given time and maybe not, not raise your hand, just start speaking. It is fine. It's a free-flowing conversation. And uh, after an hour or so, we will have a 10 or 15 minutes break. Uh, and, and afterwards, uh, it runs to 9.30. Uh, I hope that's okay with everybody. So, um, Jessica would like to know, if today's class could be lectured in a virtual reality environment, we would not have to rush here to sign in in such a poor rainy day. It is true, I, I arrived late myself uh, as a terrible traffic jam, uh, and I actually have all the VR gears, the, the HoloLens, the Oculus, the Vive gear, everything, uh, in the administration building. So uh, if, if we had an immersive uh, environment, it doesn't even have to be a headset VR. It could just be, you know, uh, a, a 180 projection screen here, or three square projectors, and people could just watch me um, having this lecture at the Executive Yuan at the administration. And in fact, we are setting something like that uh, up already. Uh, one of my um, staff member at the moment is in uh, Tokyo, and she's joining in all our uh, meetings using this Holopolis um, research project, which is holopolis.pdis.tw. Um, and Holopolis is basically our uh, current manifesto, in, in a sense, that talks about the possibilities of many immersive environments set up in something like this that brings people in many different rooms together and to have a, a sensible um, conversation. And we already produced a, a lot of content inside this uh, open source virtual reality environment. I would like to show you a, a glimpse of it. Um, it's a very, very short film. Um, like this one. Right. So instead of playing the full film, uh, we're, we're still on a uh, draft stage. It will be published on the Executive UN channel uh, when the Social Innovation Lab at the Taiwan Air Force uh, actually opens with the Prime Minister and so on visiting uh, later this month. But the idea is that we can uh, do a lot of um, video, a lot of meetings, a lot of conferences in such an immersive environment and responding um, instead of just you know a two-dimensional image, we can have people modeled as their avatars as you have seen there and have them transition very seamlessly uh, between the recorded environment and the live environment just by audio alone. So we're experimenting with a lot of uh, designers on bringing this kind of conversation in. One part we think this will be very useful is that, uh, for example, early November we will be visiting Penghu, uh, and one of the e-petitions at that at the time, uh, maybe you have read it on the newspaper, is about the marine um, the marine national park uh, called Dong Xiji. Um, 
Sidalgongyuan, the, the Four South Island uh, Marine uh, National Park. And there's this very interesting public servant, uh, Mr. Xiao Zaiquan there, who, who is actually very um, vocal on the social media, and who, who is a proponent uh, of banning fishing in that particular uh, marine park area. So we need to bring in the perspective of the divers, the fishers people, and all the people who depend on that uh, marine park uh, for the, their livelihood and so on, and for which we think the perspectives of those well, first-person views is very useful for people who have never visited Penghu. We have already uh, embarked something like this as a demonstration uh, back when we did an e-petition case about a two times left turn rule for motorcycles. If, if people here have rode uh, motorcycles, you know that it is a very peculiar rule in Taiwan that it's sometimes even in two lane uh, roads, you still have to, to turn it uh, in an L-shaped turn. And many people, especially young people, would like to have a uh, left-hand uh, lane with a direct turn and so on, an option of doing that. But for people who have never uh, drove a motorcycle, it's actually very hard to picture in our head what is it like uh, to have a different options and so on. So what, during that e-petition, one of the petitioners brought with him uh, the virtual reality recording um, based on a GoPro wide-angle uh, camera just weld on his helmet when he tries various different turns and even on highways <clears throat> and so on. And that really improved the discussion quality because even people who have not rode a motorcycle before had now has something substantial to talk about. So I think these kind of immersive uh, conversations, um, before we enter a deliberation, if we can see from each other's perspective, it's actually pretty helpful. It doesn't have to take in a very full-fledged asset point of view. Even this kind of surrounding projection is really helpful already. Uh, Charlton would like to know, Far Eastern Bank was hacked, how to avoid being hacked? Well, you can't. Uh, if you have an internet-facing uh, service, you will get hacked, period. The, the thing is that who is the, the first person who hacks you, right? Uh, once we entered uh, the, what was I become the digital minister? We set up a uh, collaborative workspace, so this is literally my workspace and people can see the uh, everything that we've worked on, the transcripts and everything. Now, this platform is actually a free software uh, platform. We didn't pay anyone anything. It's open source. It's maintained by the community. But the Department of Cybersecurity would, of course, like to know, is this secure enough? So instead of just you know relying on some, some ISO certification or whatever, what we did is much more proactive. We asked two different teams to try to hack the system. So we set it up in the administration, we put in some random content, we didn't really start using it, and then we asked the, the dev core people, who one of them, uh, actually a few of them, just won the uh, second place on the international dev uh, capture the flag competition and got um, a, a audience with President Tsai. Uh, and the, the idea is that we ask the, the best hackers, the ones who are most qualified to penetrate such systems, to hack us before we even start using it. And they did not disappoint. They find a very, very circum, um, circumvent way to, to get into the system uh, and wrote a very long uh, suggestion. And then we fed it back to the community and the community uh, fixed the problem that they have identified. And afterwards, after DevCore and the other team get um, you know, a, a second review and audit of those modifications, we're now reasonably sure that any hacker um, you know, low, lower than their skill is probably not going to find uh, security flaws that uh, intrudes into our day-to-day -day working system. So the point here is, is to be proactive. Um, instead of uh, relying on individual components uh, being individually verified, we need to set up an end-to-end -end system and really ask professional penetration testers, so-called white hat hackers, to try to give a go at it and give them a long enough time to explore and to try all the different angles. And only then uh, can you be reasonably sure that once <clears throat> intrusion happens, you can notify it and so on. There's sufficient depth uh, of, of uh, prevention. And before you get this kind of uh, professional security review, there really is no way to be sure just by certifications of them.
uh, an anonymous um, person who likes to say, if the mainland China attacks Taiwan, do you think the United States of America will protect us? I have no idea. <laughs> really, this is not my department. Uh, when, when I enter the, the uh, cabinet, I have uh, with me a few working conditions during the negotiation with uh, the Prime Minister of the Internet at the time. And uh, mostly there's three working conditions. Uh, one, many of you may maybe know, is that I get uh, the option to work from anywhere, right? I get to telecommute. Uh, so for example, every Wednesday, uh, starting from early November, I will work in the Taiwan Air Force uh, in Kongzong. So that, that becomes my mobile office. So every Wednesday, you can f just find me there. Anybody can find me and talk about social enterprise and social innovation. I was able to do that because there was a ruling in the uh, in the HR department that says any public servant who has their job relevant to uh, the internet to respond on internet can actually may at their uh, director's uh, approval may work at any time and at any place and it's a pretty obscure ruling not many people know about this but it's actually there so um, so when I got the prime minister's approval I then apply it to my team as well to PEDIS so that everybody uh, in PEDIS can also work from anywhere, from Tokyo or from anywhere. So that's my first working condition. And my second working condition is that uh, everything that I see is by default um, okay to be published uh, in the open. So in our Freedom of Information Act, there is actually one clause that says before a decision is made, any draft is not public information. You cannot really publish it unless it's for the public interest and with the director's approval. And then again, I get the prime minister saying, everything that I see, everything that I hear is for the public interest. And I can actually publish it without seeking further approval. But as an exchange, I cannot really look at any confidential information. So anything that's stamped secret, or top secret, I can't even look in, in at it. So when there was a drill, the Hanguang drill, I actually have to take a day off because I, I cannot know where the bunkers are and things like that. So I really don't know. Um, the, the National Security Council perhaps uh, have a very detailed plot during the drill uh, that, uh, that all the ministers are supposed to know or whatever, but I'm the minister that has completely no idea uh, what, what, what they have in mind. So yeah, this is the, just what it is. Um, and, the, and the third working condition I, I would also like to, uh, to say um, is, is this idea that um, instead of using the, the existing infrastructure uh, for, for work, I get to deploy my own uh, working environment. And this means, of course, introducing secure uh, workplace software such as this instead of the, the normal system. But this also means uh, not just that, but also using Slido, using uh, real-time board, using GoodNotes, using all those digital tools to enhance. Uh, so basically, the Prime Minister trusts my judgment in bringing all those free software and open source tools as long as they get a sufficient security uh, audit or review. That also changes the relationship between us and the vendors because now we're not really reliant on the vendors to procure information systems. We become a developer, uh, a like a small vendor inside the administration with coders, with designers and so on that can create our own information system and deploy it for the general public um, public uh, servant workforce. So for example, this uh, ey.pdis.tw, it's not really just, just with our team. Actually, we have every ministry's people on it. Because if your email ends with gov.tw, you automatically get an account, and you can just use it for, for any purpose, right? So, so I think this is really for the entire public service, and not just for, for our team. So we actually have a, a lot of different shared folders uh, with a lot of different ministries and task forces and so on. So that's the three working conditions. Um, um, Huang Shiping would like to know, you encourage civil servants to solve problems of public affairs through internet. Do you think that it really enhances efficiency and does it have side effects? Well, uh, for one, uh, if I answer this question, I answer not only Huang Shiping's question, but also three other people, right? So it's, uh, it's much more efficient in the sense that I answer essentially four. Uh, people's questions in, in one go. So a uh, digital tools like this is what we call cheap and cheerful. It's cheap, meaning that 
you don't really have to learn a new system just because of it, because everything on this uh, platform, the typing in, the press and like, and things like that, you already know, probably from Facebook or from Line or from other uh, software. So when we introduce tools like this, uh, we don't exclude uh, that much people, so it's, it's cheap. But it's cheerful in the sense that it doesn't really take my attention away from you, nor your attention away from me. Instead, it serves as a reminder of what the current topic is. So it's just that. It's not intrusive. It doesn't really beep all the time like the line app tend to do, right? And so it doesn't really um, interfere with the normal flow of work. And when something that stays outside of the flow of the work and enhance the uh, attention, the focus of people involved, we call this ambient technology or calm technology that calms everybody uh, down. So it does enhance efficiency, but I think more importantly, it increases the psychological um, healthiness of public service. Um, so instead of like um, instant messengers uh, beeping all the time, we have this very calm uh, topic indicator here that people can just take a little bit of a look and then go back and hear me speak and so on. So we try to introduce technologies like this that improves but without taking or excluding anyone. Does it have side effects? Well, it does. Um, um, I think one of the things that this uh, really creates is this uh, power balance. During a long meeting, for example, we, we have these quarterly meetings with every ministry's deputy minister about the open government plan, as well as the participation officers in each ministry. Now, without Slido and without any way to anonymously post the comments, usually it's just the chair, right, setting the agenda, and nobody really has anything to say until uh, explicitly cued by the chair. But that creates a lot of power imbalance because uh, maybe somebody really has something very good to say, but because the chair or, or her or his minister or deputy minister is speaking about something, they're long-winded and they don't really want to interrupt. But with Slido, uh, they can anonymously interrupt and then provide a pertinent information that alerts everybody of what's going on and the people's attention get to focus on the things instead of on the people. Because in public service, really, we, we focus on people too much. We, we try to um, you know, put accountability, putting credit and blame and assignment and whatever on people, which is great, I mean, if it gets things done. But during the flow of work, sometimes we don't really need, you know, cancellation or resetting of the course. We just need a little bit of a reminder. And in things like this, it's too heavy-handed. Um, if you have to go through the approval process, if you have to write a formal email, if you have to do anything that's that formal, that means it's just like raising your hand to speak. It, it, it really is a threshold in which people will have to climb over psychologically. But by introducing cheap and cheerful technologies like this, people get to participate in setting the agenda of what the group thinks, what uh, the direction the meeting is heading. And generally, we find it has the side effect of really making meetings more interesting because people have a say in where the meeting is going instead of just zoning out uh, and, and not, not listening. And I think it also has another good side effect is that um, it takes over your phone. If your phone is on Slido, your phone is not on you know, Facebook or Line or email or some other apps, right? So the, the idea is that it also makes uh, distraction less uh, time consuming for the audience involved. That's the side effects that we have found so far. How can we use new technologies in e-learning, like augmented reality, virtual reality, or mixed reality? That's a great question. Um, first of all, we, we really need uh, to look at technologies uh, from what we ask of the technology instead of what the technology demands of us, right? So as a technologist, I think uh, when I just look at meetings and I see a problem of people you know, zoning out, distracting and so on, then I introduce this kind of technology. We never introduce technology without a reason. So uh, for augmented and virtual reality, obviously it solves one of the issues that uh, when people look at PowerPoints and look at uh, you know, general descriptions without first-hand experience, people generally don't know what we're talking about, about diving or fishing or riding a motorcycle. And to solve this you know, first-hand experience issue, we can introduce virtual reality and immersive experience for the purpose of informing people in the same room. And that's so far one of the more solid way of introducing. It also has a good uh, effect in a sense that it requires very little uh, technological in, um, intervention 
in the sense that if you have one 360 camera, it's really cheap nowadays. It's not even 10 thousand k, so it's well within the budget of people to just uh, take a 360 recording of whatever they're experiencing. And then once you play it in an immersive environment, in AR and VR, or just on YouTube or, or Facebook with this, um, you know, rotatable view and so on, it really does enhance people's knowledge of the person experiences. <clears throat> now, aside from this kind of just informed based. Um, use, one of the things that we're solving now is whether we can also use it for the output, like for two rooms to overlap with each other. So if I put on the HoloLens, uh, those chairs that's empty gets replaced by avatars of people who are actually at home. And then uh, we get to um, participate in this meeting as one room, even though we're physically in two or three different rooms. At the moment, the main technological um, problem is uh, First is bandwidth, because it's a lot of bandwidth to transmit the uh, body language, the finer expressions, and so on, but also on the viewing experience. But those, I think, uh, can be solved within a year or so. Do you think that let people talk about policy on the web, just as our um, government pushing currently, can make deliberative democracy? Well, no, <laughs> it doesn't really make deliberative democracy, but, but it does in, enable people to care about policies. I think it is one of the um, cheaper way to get people in the mood for deliberative democracy, but it's not in itself deliberative democracy, because to be deliberative, one need to, to listen, right? And online, there's too much people who just want to speak, want to post things without actually listening. And in that kind of environment, it's not really deliberative. It's a lot of people shouting out their ideas, which is really useful in itself already. We call it dissent as data. Meaning that if you go to the, the join platform, um, there's really a lot of uh, very interesting petitions going on. And within, wow, classify the cigarettes as class two drug. Who would have thought about that? Um, so. Within all those uh, e-petitions, we can actually see um, a lot of people who are out there criticizing specific policy issues. Nevertheless, when we provide this kind of um, discussion area, actually it has a very good input on the left-hand side of this environment. And, for, and this is not actually that controversial, so let's get some more controversial issues, like the nuclear power plant. Um, right. And here, we, we actually have pretty reasonable discussions on both sides. And I think one of the reasons why people uh, can participate in this kind of descendants data platform instead of escalating into name calling and shouting at each other is that we designed this forum uh, without the option to reply, just as Slido is. So. Maybe you, you can see in Slido, really there is no way to reply to somebody else. You can just propose your own opinion. And it's the same here. You can't really, uh, if you disagree with this person, the only thing you can do is press like or dislike, or propose a better counter argument on the other side of the things. And just because this very simple design decision, um, people actually compete for consensus on both sides of the aisle instead of attacking each other. And this enables us to very quickly get a glance of the top like five uh, comments and get a, a overview of what the current best um, arguments are without going into the very lower level of things. So again, it is using the crowd as the moderation in itself. So this is what we call by space design. One of the early versions of this website had this bar, the green and red bar, proportional to the comments being posted. So in this example, it will go all over here, and the 32 would be much shorter. But we, we found that it encouraged spamming behavior, where people would just post the same thing again and again, just to get their bar longer. And this is really meaningless, right? This is not a very useful use of anybody's time. So, which is why I requested the design to be exactly in the middle, no matter how many comments get uh, posted. So some very small details, design details like this, really has a really large effect on how people turn their dissent into data that we can use. Still, it's not deliberative. We, we don't think people generally listen to each other's side very deeply on this. So for the really um, deliberative side, 
we actually have to turn to um, face-to-face -face meetings. And when we run face-to-face -face meetings, like for example, Lemon Car, um, we make sure that it's not just one-sided. Instead, we get all the stakeholders. And I think one of the things that often gets overlooked when the um, public service runs deliberations is the internal stakeholders. That is to say, all the local governments, all the different agencies who have a stake in this kind of agenda setting. And one of the points that we try to make is because we have a participation officer in every uh, ministry, they only vote on the things that they are interested in talking about. So if uh, they are not interested in a, a uh, issue or the e-petition case can be handled by one ministry alone, we don't actually go to this kind of collaborative meetings. If they are interested, then they have a stake in it and they are much more uh, willing to find people within their ministry or within their agency that actually cares about this kind of issues. So I think uh, one of the um, key points here is that we run those deliberative meetings uh, on Friday or during the parliamentary inquiry session on Wednesday, but it's always on a business day and it's always on office hour. It's usually from 10 to, to 2. So for the public service people, it, it also counts as educational hours. So, so there, there's really nothing to lose, right? <laughs> Even you, you have to travel to Taipei, it's just like attending a workshop. And Although the petitioners really suffers a little bit because they, they first they have to ask for a leave hour and so on. But if they really care about it that much, and there's 5,000 of them, usually we, we get three or uh, five of the petitioners. So this is especially uh, useful when the petitioner itself is an organized um, group, such as the Gongdou, who uh, uh, like the, how do I translate this? The worker struggle. The, the worker struggle recently proposed on the e-petition platform to add back seven days of holidays, but not just for uh, the people working as workers, but also for everybody, including here, or people here, right? So, so it's uh, a, a interesting petition that gets thousands of, of uh, counter signatures. But maybe within that 5,000 people who countersign for it, not everybody agrees with the angle that the worker struggle is going with it. So by enlisting sampling from those 5,000 people, we get a much more um, multi-angled perspective than the classical uh, public hearing scene where the one group just sends five people or 10 people and takes over one side of the conversation. So it's not a negotiation. It's more like, okay, we all care about this policy issue. Let's take a look at it at, in every angle possible kind of collaboration. And that is the seed of deliberative democracy because that means everybody ends up learning something even if it doesn't really go all the way to your original demands. That's the basic idea. Uh, Warren Chen would like to know, do you think AI may eventually destroy human beings in the future? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, well, I, I, think, I think human beings may destroy us so in the future. It really doesn't need <laughs> AI's help. Um, so uh, before we actually have full machine intelligence or artificial intelligence, we already have more than sufficient arsenals uh, to destroy ourselves. So if um, it really doesn't take AI to destroy human beings, that's, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that the current generation of machine learning of artificial intelligence is actually very limited. Um, it is um, basically there's a rule of thumb that says if anything uh, you can think or you can do in one second, then the current generation of AI can do it. So this is a very quick heuristic. It's like looking at somebody's face and remembering who that person is. AI can do it very well. And um, if you hear a bunch, uh, a sentence of English and translate it in your mind to Mandarin, that takes less than one second, so AI can do it. So the idea is that we have a lot of processing in our brain that is very compartmentized. And for each compartmentized function that takes a human being less than one second, currently we have the technology to move it out from our brain to some external way to outsource it. But if this is a thought process that requires a synthesized uh, understanding, a, a common sense of things that requires more than one second of serious thought, actually if it's deliberative, meaning that if you have to deeply think about it, then at the moment uh, we actually don't have any evidence that the current generation of AI technology can take over that. <coughs> so 
even for the best driverless cars, that also means that when we're driving, we're not thinking very deeply about driving, <laughs> where we're mostly relying on train instinct and so on uh, for, for driving to happen. So with the current generation of AI technology, I don't think it will destroy human beings by any means. It's mostly just an outsourcing of the cognitive functions that we have in our brain. Now, hypothetically, of course, if we integrate sufficient number of this kind of technology with ourselves, then uh, human beings get upgraded. We become bionic, meaning that we become some other species that uh, evolves with uh, the machines. And this ha has happened before. For example, during the early human evolution, uh, we discovered this interesting species called wolves. And the wolves co-domesticated with humans by co-evolving on the same neural circuit that controls what we call gaze. Uh, so I think humans are dogs, are uh, share the same protocol, the same way of looking and following where the other's eyes are looking and bring out a similar um, emotional experience just by following people's uh, gaze alone. And this, co this is not a trait of very early uh, hominoids, and this is not a trait for wolves. Uh, there is sufficient um, evidence to support the hypothesis that maybe human beings in communities and dogs co-evolve this as a way to communicate. So it's co-domestication, it's not just us domesticating the dogs, it's also dogs domesticating humans by forming a symbiotic relationship. So this is very much like the situation with driverless car. If there's a driverless car on the road, it is like a, a new species on the road. It still has to learn the ways to communicate effectively with humans and also for humans to understand what is signal are and our driving behavior will change because of this kind of new species. So there will be a period of co-domestication, but there's a limit in which uh, we treat it as something other than us with its own autonomy, its own individuality versus if it's part of us. If we think AI is part of us and we extend the idea of ourself to include the, the external brain or whatever, then essentially it will destroy the idea of human beings because we become some other species. But it is not in the literal sense of just killing everybody. You know, it's basically us merging with our phones or something. So that may happen, but uh, it doesn't happen in the you know uh, Terminator scenario or the Skynet scenario or many other scenario, and especially not the Matrix scenario. Um, Arnold would like to know, uh, do you know what is the actual fact about the satellite for Wave Wuhan? Can the problem be solved? Actually, no, I, I don't have more information than, than you do. I also just read from the newspapers uh, about, <laughs> about the CCMOS calibration, about the, the angles, the, the blurring spots, and things like that. Because um, see, I'm the digital minister, I'm not the minister for uh, science and technology. That, that would be a minister with a portfolio. So, so um, I, I'm not overseeing directly the Fuewuha team, but I'm hoping the best. Uh, Joyce would like to know, do you think HTC so mobile section for developing VR section is a right decision? Huh, that's a very good question. Um, actually, tomorrow, Google and HTC are going to come to my office and talk about this very thing. So, so and, and as with any other public visits, we will make a radically transparent record of every single word uh, that, that we have said and publish it um, somewhere here, right? So. Um, Many of you perhaps already know that ever since I joined the government, I record every single meeting that I have met uh, with the interviewers, with lobbyists, uh, with even internal ones, internal meetings. And for the external visits, uh, the interviewers and so on get 10 days uh, to modify this transcript before it gets published. And for the civil servants, uh, people get 10 working days, which is uh, usually two weeks. So uh, because of today's uh, visit is classified as an external visit, so within seven calendar days, you will see the transcript of my conversation uh, with Google Taiwan's CEO and uh, the, the HTC team. So yeah, I'll, I, I look forward to learn more about this question, and you will see this question answered in 10 days. I currently have no idea, but tomorrow I expect to have some idea. Um, Jimmy would like to ask, I believe you must know the mass killing in Las Vegas. Do you think it has something to do with people nowadays spending too much time on electronic devices? No, no, not at all. I think it has something to do with the uh, uh, accessibility of rifles. Um, I, I think it's it's uh, really it's 
easy to, to confuse correlation with causation. Just because people are spending a lot of time online like this, doesn't really mean that any incident that happens like this is a causation of, of that. It doesn't really make sense, right? Uh, and uh, from what I know, um, of course it is a, a deeply um, contested subject of whether extended um, exposure to um, social media like Facebook or so on makes people more lonely or makes people more antisocial and so on. But so far, I haven't seen any conclusive study that points from here to m killing people. Like, this is this far. We, we have some evidence that says it causes some uh, mild depression. We have some evidence that says, you know, it, it tends to reinforce conservative ideas about politics. It tends to isolate people from people who are too different from each other. This we have pretty solid social science support. But from here to killing people, no, I, I don't think so. I haven't seen any study that points even slightly toward that direction. Um, she would like to know, do you think how to encourage the younger generation, especially the girls, to participate in the new technology research, such as VR or IT? Well, I, I think, um, especially for, for uh, information technology, really the machine doesn't care about your, your gender, or for that matter, your age, or your race, or your height, or whatever, right? So, so I think that's one of the areas where we really see a lot of um, participation. Uh, from from people, I just attended last night a um, conference, well, a a show and tell uh, workshop by the Data for Social Good uh, people, and I'm very happy to see that not only the presenters but the communities that they work with are extremely good in a diversity kind of way. It's very gender balanced, and there's existing. Um, communities such as the R ladies and so on who are data scientists that are just created around the idea that to make girls feel safe and have uh, very easy access to role models and, and mentors and so on. So I think uh, with communities like this, this really is the key because um, when learning a new technology and especially programming, um, programming language is a lot like natural language. If you don't have a community to speak, you can't really learn this language, which is, I presume, why we have this class, right? So the idea is that you get to use English in a real-world scenario instead of just answering something from the textbooks. So the same with computer languages. If you don't, if you don't have something interesting for you, not the social or personal motivation to solve some problem together with a bunch of friends, then there's very little motivation to to learn just for the sake of uh, learning it. So. I think programs like the Gov Zero or Data for Social Good is very good because there are really people who care about the society very much. They care about the pollution, they care about the population uh, asymmetry, they care about equal access for, for Aboriginal indigenous people, for new migrants, for, for equality, for digital inclusion, for a lot of things. And this pairs people who have interesting problems to solve to people who have the skill or want to learn the skill uh, to solve it. And so this kind of uh, social innovation and social enterprise um, arrangements, I think, are the perfect way uh, for the young people, and especially young girls, to infuse with the community, not just reinforces the skill, but also reinforces the idea of the skill for the common good. And I think that's the one of the more sure way uh, to encourage the younger generation to get into technology, not just to solve their personal problem, but also to solve the wider society's problem. Um, this, this question by me, I've kind of already answered. Uh, the current government agencies use VR for uh, demonstration purposes. There are many museums, there are many uh, exhibitions at the moment where uh, if you just step into it and put on the glasses and so on, it brings you to, to Dunhuang or it brings you to some other place that's very far away and basically get people the first time experience. And people use that for journalism, for reporting as well. And this is something that especially local government agencies are very interested in uh, for cultural or for purpose preservation uh, reasons. Uh, but VR for what we call social VR or shared reality, that still requires some technological and design um, work, So, which is what we're working on. And where we're looking to have a more collaborative, uh, many people in the VR experience, um, maybe in a year or so, uh, based on our current research efforts. 
Brian would like to know, 99% computers on the market cannot ha handle the high-end tests that you need for a true virtual reality experience. So should the government spend a lot of money? No, not at all. Um, so by the, by the end of this year or early next year, uh, the entry level, very good uh, VR experience um, called Oculus Go uh, will be costing maybe $6,000 or so. And that's already a very good experience uh, level. So what we're seeing is that the, the price is shrinking like this. And there is one key technology in VR called foveated rendering. It's a, technical term. It means that like dogs, it tracks your gaze, it knows where your eyes are looking at. Um, so once the, the headset knows where you're looking at, it only needs to paint that area with detail and everything else can be blurry. And that reduces the use of the CPU and the gra uh, graphical processing unit to like one tenth or something. So after the wide deployment of this technology, any tablet, any phone can run VR just fine. So um, I think that's still um, half a year or a year away, but we're, we're just seeing the device plummeting like this. So no, I, I'm, not, I'm certainly not ordering like all the agencies to spend tens of thousands of NT dollars just to get uh, VR viewing equipment because they're, they're shrinking like this uh, in price. But for VR authoring environment, of course, we need really high-end VR, but that's just fine. Uh, because just like professional uh, movie producing um, equipment like that one, uh, it, it's okay to be a little bit costly because you only buy it once and you can use it many times. So no, this is not a very good time to spend a lot of money um, uh, like giving every child a VR viewing device. Um, Jamie would like to ask, can you tell us Will VR lead us somewhere in terms of human value? It's just a game of fashion, finally end up in the middle of nowhere. Well, it will do both, certainly. Um, I, I think one of the key here is what we call the shared reality. If through VR, we get to meet real people in their real habitat, sharing their authentic first-hand experience, then we get to know each other more. And, and that is, I think, a, a, a very good use of VR, because otherwise it's very hard to step into each other's shoes. But if all we are using VR is just for, you know, in fantasy land and, and basically just for oneself and excluded from the rest of humanity. First of all, I don't think that's very interesting. Uh, I don't know many people who immerse themselves in VR just for that kind of purpose. Um, and second of all, you can get that kind of uh, thing much easier just with a you know room of one's own and stockpile with the things they want and with some uh, large screen TVs, people already do that and it's much more convenient anyway. So uh, I think um, one of the longer lasting values of VR will be just to transmit first-hand experience, whether it's the masters in a vocational skill uh, transferring how to cook, how to fix a motorcycle, how to do any of those things that requires the whole body, or to, for educational purposes, to transmit uh, to a large number of students what exactly is the teacher thinking and looking for and things like that. That the social value, I think, is the lasting uh, value of VR, and everything else is pretty much a, a gimmick, um, just for, for advertisements or um, stock prices purposes. Julia and I would like, you know, would you like to share some thoughts on how to get along with the use for the middle-aged person uh, like me? Uh, this is a great question. Um, I, I remember um, from my own experience, I, I call my grandma and my mom uh, like every Sunday, and I visit them every month in Danshui. All my four grandparents uh, are in Danshui, and my oldest grandpa is like 99 years old or something, uh, about to turn 100 in a few months. So uh, uh, all along the way, uh, we, we try to have all sorts of different conversations. And I think if there is, um, you know, problems of not getting along, it's usually because one side knows too much about something and the other side knows nothing about that thing. And because there's no first-hand experience, right, so, um, and there's no VR, so, so it, 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 there's very, it's very hard to get uh, into the same thought space because one can say a lot of things, but it really means nothing to the other side. Um, but what, what we have seen uh, in the community, for example, when Pokemon Go came out, what we, what we saw is that the grandparents in the community um, actually get along very well with their grandchildren even, and, and their children just to, to roam around the park and catching Pokemons and whatever. Uh, but that's because 
Nobody knows anything about this. This is something entirely new. Nobody has any first experience about capturing Pokemons in the park because the human species have never captured Pokemons in the park, right? So, so that creates a situation where intergenerationally, all the different generations have something new to look at, but every part of them brings something uh, to the table, right? Uh, they can share their own stories relating to this whole game without getting trapped into, okay, I know a lot of things, but how do I get a message across? So I think my suggestion would be simply to find something that you know the young generation and your generation both knows nothing about. And then, and then just learn, learn on it together or experiment together, because then there, nobody is in the you know entrenched position to to talk about something that one knows very well. Because if you know something too well, you tend to use the words that means very little to to other people, unless you consciously correct your own words uh, about it. But if it's something entirely new, well, there's no problems about that. Um, the Anonymous would like to know the TSMC's chairperson, Morris, is about to retire next year. What do you guys think about his impact on Taiwan? Well, first, um, I think he is a, a living proof that um, you know age is not a concern when it comes to innovation and when it comes to uh, connecting and explaining his thoughts to younger people. Uh, he is mm, something like 80 something, 86 now, and he obviously has no problem at all contributing uh, not just to our board of science and technology and to the TSMC, but to the general uh, public about what he thinks, what books he's reading and things like that. So I, I think it is a really good symbol uh, in the sense that the, the older aged people can look to Morris and, and think, well, it's that the spirit is still young, and uh, there really age is not a, a problem when talking about cutting edge technology and things like that. So that has one impact by being a living proof. And the, the other thing is that uh, I think he, he really um, sit, charted out the TSMSC's values and uh, communicated really well with the general society so that the same values probably still carries on uh, and uh, still the relationship between TSMC and Taiwan um, remains pretty stable uh, with their latest investments and their latest recruitment plans and things like that. So I think he really thought about it really carefully and um, really put out a lot of very, to me, very sensible um, plans uh, for his successors uh, to make. So I think that's also a, a idea of social responsibility, <laughs> the, the idea of how a corporate governance um, person like, like he obviously is can be as a model to other um, like both cross-national and national companies when it comes to communicating with the public and the stakeholders involved. So, so I think that's a pretty positive model. Uh, Chen Liling would like to ask, how do you know that our computer systems is secure? I don't. Uh, I, 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 know, I know many things about uh, the lack of security and security vulnerabilities, but I, I don't know much about uh, proven security. There really is, is no absolute security uh, in any computer systems, and that's because uh, it's operated by humans. If, if the, the, the computer system is entirely automated, then we have a, some way to mathematically prove uh, the properties of the system so that uh, we know that it will not get out of bounds. But as long as there is human beings in the system, we're very complicated creatures. We don't even know what, what makes us tick, right? So <laughs> there is always the chance uh, through social engineering, through a lot of uh, you know, human skills, to, to influence people in the system so that the system becomes insecure because of the operator uh, involved. In fact, that is how uh, the DEF core team, which I mentioned earlier, during the penetration testing, is finally able to, to uh, get into the system, the sandstorm system that we have set. It's not because the programming did anything wrong. It's the administrator doing the configuration did something, um, a human mistake. So uh, time after time, we see that the weakest link is human beings. And as long as you have humans in the system, you can uh, account for the, the, the uh, accident. You can make fallback plans. You can make a lot of preventions and so on. But it, it, there's no 100% security. You just need to have a long set of plan Bs. Um, Jay from the National Audit Office. Uh, would like to say, um, this is our latest topic about childcare. 
Okay, so there's a link, and I'm supposed to open it. Um, so we open it. Uh, does that work? Yeah, it works. All right. So um, <laughs> I thought this is pretty nice. It explains the issues really well. And there's, interestingly, a lot of responses. Um, I, I don't really uh, think question seven need to be asked. Um, like this 300 yes and no no's. Uh, and people basically are saying, we agree with whatever you're saying. Well, I think it's still good, right? It builds rapport and then lets people see, you know, I, I agree with it along with 300 other people, which is pretty good feeling, I guess. Um, but, but otherwise, uh, there's uh, substantial replies and there's very good materials. And I think it, it really, uh, I, I use the, the CY, the corrective UN example, during the uh, monthly and quarterly meeting to our participation officer. Um, and my point using CY is a example is that it is harmless. Um, it, it doesn't, the ministry tend to think if we uh, put out something for public consultation, it must be something very large, very controversial, uh, that gets a lot of people talking and so on. But that's because they mostly look at the petition cases. The petition cases are, of course, controversial because people have been able to mobilize it so that you can actually look at those 5,000 people because it's called survivorship bias, right? The, the really harmless topics doesn't even get the attention to get to 5,000 people. But that's for... That's for the citizen-led petitions. For the agencies themselves, it's entirely okay to have relative harmless topics like this, where people can only add to something without you know, debating over whether it is actually needed or not. And the people still ap appreciate it. I mean, if you are a stakeholder and you have a way to improve the, how the corrective UN or how the executive UN does things, well, why not? It, it's just as long as they know that they get sufficient attention, that the administrator uh, puts in at least the same amount of time to the people who type in those very thoughtful words at a time, well then they can uh, tell the other people that they want to contribute. Especially now the joint platform, out of the 23 uh, million people in Taiwan, I think about 4 million unique people is using the joint platform. So it, it really captures a lot of uh, attention from the general public of the topic we put on. So even if re it's relatively regional, it's relatively harmless, we still get some uh, pretty good insights from the public participation. Um, Arnold would like to know, Zuckerberg apologized, yes, I see, I saw that, for FB was used to divide people rather than bring human together. How do you comment on this? Is our world going to be better without a Facebook? Um, well, in the, in the spirit of radical transparency, I have to say, I just came off a meeting with Facebook. They, they uh, visited us in the administration and we were talking about uh, Mark's uh, social commitment. And I joked saying that, so Facebook is now having a solid social mission and of bringing people together in the community values and it's coding it uh, like into the, the, the company's uh, documents that all the employees are required to follow, uh, and it's reinvesting a significant amount of its profit uh, to further the social mission. And as does that make uh, Facebook a social enterprise? Um, and uh, people from Facebook said, yeah, Mark certainly want to take Facebook toward that direction. Now, um, whether this is just because the, this turn is just beginning. Well, we don't really know whether Facebook actually embarks on a social mission or whether, you know, it's, we don't actually know as a fact whether they divide people together is because they're malicious, they're bad guys, or if they're incompetent, meaning that they, they can't really uh, do things well even if they in the places they should. And th this is not my harsh words, it's their VP. When I visited Facebook, he said it himself, saying that please attribute it to our incompetence rather than our malice uh, for this kind of things. And, and I think this is a pretty healthy um, 
attitude for a company to take, and actually something that the public service in Taiwan also can learn from. There's many times when the public criticizes uh, the digital minister or the public service for not doing things right enough. I, I think I usually just came and said, you know, thank you for your contribution. We know there are limits, and, and it's not for the lack of trying. We did try, but we, we, we're just getting good at it. This is especially important given the message uh, about this administration being the administration that uh, is most proficient on communicating. Uh, we, we all know that we don't get to a without actually communicating quite a few times. So usually now I say we're the, the administration who most uh, would like to communicate, but it really takes a lot of practice, a lot of training to get to the point where you can communicate authentically and without fearing, without uncertainty, without doubt when facing demands from random people. And the same with, with Facebook. So, but I'm not saying this to their defense or their excuse. They really have to come clean about a lot of the different decisions they're, they're, they're making and a lot of the ways that their system's working before the public can see it as an ally instead of a uh, adversary in democracy. So we're still working with them, but I'm uh, willing to because I am an optimist myself. So so I'm pretty optimistic that uh, we can find someone uh, or some people um, or some group uh, within Facebook that is willing to work toward this direction. And if not, well, we can work on better alternatives in other private sector uh, partnerships. But it is a fact of life that the majority of Taiwan is uh, people is on Facebook in one way or another. So I think it is very important for us to have a uh, good direct bi-directional relationship with its leadership. Uh, Hanshiko would like to know, do you feel optimistic or pessimistic about our future relationship with mainland China? And do you have any suggestion? Well, um, as I said, I, I, I am an optimist. And um, I, at this very strange condition, especially around mainland China, uh, I think uh, began when I was 15 or so. Um, as some of you know, I dropped out of a junior high school that year in 1996 because I discovered this thing called World Wide Web. And on the World Wide Web, there's people who give out their knowledge, their papers for free. And I saw that those things are like 10 years ahead of the textbook that I have in the junior high school or even in universities. And I think at that time, I really have a, uh, a hard time going to the principal of the junior high school and say, you know, principal, I want to drop out. But we both know it's mandatory education. So you have to tell the Ministry of Education that I'm still going to class, otherwise I get fined. So, uh, but the principal actually agreed, much to my surprise, because she also saw the uh, importance of the World Web and also the free sharing of the knowledge that I tried to describe to her, and she's very enlightened, and she basically agreed. I think from that point onwards, because I was raised in this community of people freely given uh, their, their knowledge, their culture, their first-hand experiences, and many of them at, at the time really doesn't care about the location or the country or where the place that you're coming from. So we all build the internet together regardless of where geographically we are uh, located. So I think that the strange condition of optimism was kind of just set uh, around that time. So, um, so very uh, factually speaking, even after I become the digital minister, I still taught classes uh, in Hangzhou, actually. Uh, I set up a virtual reality classroom with Hangzhou and with Kaohsiung at the same time, and fused those two classrooms together and taught how to do deliberations in virtual reality. And um, I'm also recording a video to talk about Sandstorm, to talk about how, how we run this uh, secure, uh, doesn't need internet connection, intranet uh, workspace, and recording it as a video for the open source community in, in Chongqing uh, a couple of weeks after this. So I mean for education, for culture, for science, uh, there really is no, no reason to specifically exclude uh, people just because they're from any geographic location. Now of course I try not to physically travel to mainland China. It's a lot of hassle for a minister to do that uh, nowadays, if not impossible. But uh, I think with virtual reality, with telepresence robots and things like that, there really is a lot of room uh, for dialogue. 
uh, with with uh, people, whatever geographic location they are at. Now, all this is, is my personal opinion. I don't really represent the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or whatever that, but I'm pretty optimistic about the prospect of communication. Um, can you share about? Uh, Christina would like to know, could you share us about the privacy of big data? Well, this is a very big question. <laughs> and um, I, I think it's, um, I, I would say it is very um, easy for us to think of privacy as a on or off, uh, you have it or you don't have it equation. While in reality, privacy is a like a gray area. Uh, any piece about you actually is a kind of a privacy loss in the technical sense. But uh, the current privacy law in Taiwan at the moment, although written and enforced in a pretty clear fashion by the Ministry of Justice, um, doesn't designate one data protection authority to get all the regional governments and all the national uh, ministries the same set of interpretation on the privacy. And that causes a, a kind of uh, split even within the same regional city. Different bureaus may think of the privacy impacts of the same uh, data and the same algorithm and interpret it very differently. And many of them still haven't caught up on the um, processing of data um, for, for example, for anonymity and things like that. So I think what, what we need at the moment is a, a baseline of education, a baseline of literacy, and a baseline of consistency of what actually do we mean by privacy and how do we uh, apply it consistently on the big data issue. So uh, the National Development Council actually issued a um, document to all the agencies saying they are setting up a platform for deliberation on uh, data, right? So uh, the, the private data deliberation platform, within the National Development Council, is our attempt. Uh, before we have a dedicated data protection authority, we will eventually get there. Before we have that, we will at least have the interpretation of those privacy issues and uh, laws not be a relationship just between uh, one department sometimes with the stakeholders directly, sometimes with the Ministry of Justice. We try to have the Ministry of Justice interpretations to be widely known, widely applicable for the National Development uh, Council to take this interpretation and try to translate it into something that the civil servants can all understand and publish it on a platform where all the different civil service parts have access to. So once we have sufficient cases on this platform, at least we can start to have an intelligent conversation about whether your case looks like this previous case or whether this gets applied uh, consistently. So we're not taking power away from the Ministry of Justice for their interpretation of the privacy law, but we're trying to streamline it and also make it more publicly known and also make it much more consistent by having all the stakeholders to look at the same set of things on the platform. So that's the, the basic idea. Um, there's also another related, very technical idea called open algorithms. Um, sometimes people look at a piece of database, say the National Health Insurance Database, and say, you know, this is very valuable. If we just open this up, uh, it can create a lot of uses and abuses, apparently. And, and previously, people also thought it as a, like a either or. You have to open the data or you close the data. If you close the data, you don't get the social good applications. But if you open the data, you're in violation of privacy. But that is not a very useful way to think about things. So at the moment, what we're trying to do is that we're taking the concept of open data a part of private data. If you see open data, it's never private data. It's something that's just statistics. And if you see private data, it is not going to be just randomly opened and violating people's privacy. Instead, we're, we're working with the case where we ask the research community what would be a better way to run statistics that will help their research. And they publish their algorithm, their way to handle the data, their programs, and then for the um, deliberation platform and for the agency to look at it, and for the data owner, for the agency itself to run the code locally. 
and making sure that it doesn't really violate privacy and publish only the statistics that's the output of those data to the research community. And so in this way, what's open is the algorithm, is the code, it's not the data. The data always stays within the data controller, the data owner, but it may be run in novel statistical ways if it was widely seen by the research community as not privacy violating. So this is where we're going. We're supposed to have a break around this time now, or uh, it's eight o'clock, okay. Right, so do we take a break? Okay, so let's take a 15 minutes break and, and, and people are free to just submit more questions during the 15 minutes break. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Uh, we will have 10, uh, we will have 15 minutes break. Please come back in 15 minutes, thank you. Also remind you, if you have post the question on the slido, Dot com. So please come to our assistant counselor to write down your name and your office. If you have already answered in slido.com, then please write the question. If you are late for class, please join us at slido.com. Thank you. Oh yeah, please, please. I like it. Uh, the microphone will be like yeah, please wait for a while. Thank you. Uh, my question is: uh, Do you think um, our country can develop AI industry well? Well, great question. Um, yes. <laughs> Um, AI is one of the, the few things um, that does, does not require as much as um, a upfront investment in any given field. Rather, AI requires uh, a cross-discipline uh, work. In this regard, AI is very much like virtual reality. To design a virtual reality, not device, but experience well, you need people who study um, language, you need people who, who study uh, choreography, meaning uh, like the art of theater and dancing. You need people who study psychology, you need people who study philosophy, you need people who, who study all those very soft skills in order to make an experience that feel immersive and authentic. And the same is with AI. There are some, of course, very technical parts with the AI uh, for the semiconductor manufacturing, for the sensors, for things like that, which coincidentally is also Taiwan, where Taiwan is very good at, right? But aside from those very basic hardware part of the AI, all the application of AI requires essentially thinking what kind of cognitive functions from our brain is better if we move it outside and give it its own personality to interact with the rest of the world. And this is a very imaginative work. This is not some hard work just by one or two people specializing in one given field. It requires working much closer to human beings than to machines. And I think Taiwan's unique advantage is because we have uh, absolute uh, speech freedom, right? Any times the government tries to pass something, even if it touches a little bit about the freedom of speech, uh, everybody just goes and opposes it. So as a result, in Asia, and I would say in the world, we're one of the places, if not the place, with the, the most free press and the free thinking, really, um, all sort of very uh, unorthodox ideas such as a ministry that advocates for anarchy, right? So it really is <laughs> a, a place with utmost freedom of thought. And so because of that, we see a lot of people working across disciplines, across different fields, on novel applications of AI. So I think that is our unfair advantage when developing AI, in the sense that we first have people who specialize in very different fields, and we are a collaborative culture where people are now seeing, especially people younger than me, 
that are, are, work, are used to working together even with complete strangers, trusting strangers online to do work, which is the other part of AI. It's about building a relationship with users, even you haven't met them before, and basically have the AI trust humanity and for the humanity to trust back. And I think this is something that Taiwan really has a very good culture at. That's my, my answer. Any other thoughts? Yes. Is uh, uh, the uh, the emerging parents of the electrical cars uh, will provide the Taiwan a golden chance uh, to outstrip uh, others uh, 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 car company or 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 have a or provide Taiwan a chance to uh, surpass others uh, country in the in the sales of or, uh, Manufacturers like uh, cars or cars, uh, and uh, also it uh, the second question is also related to electric cars. Uh, what's your uh, opinion if the if uh, in the in the in the uh, period of the, the, uh, the emerge, emergence emergence of the electric cars, uh, or will the traditional car company like Mercedes or BMW? Will still uh, prevail and both uh, outstrip the their counterparts, or or eventually some some uh, Taiwan electrical car company like the Thunder Power have already set the uh, manufacturers company in, in the main China will have a golden chance to uh, to uh, outstrip the Mr. Benz or BMWs. What you come? Uh, right. I, I think, yeah, electric cars, I think, well, even if not Taiwan branded, even if Tesla, right, many of the core parts are actually innovated and, and still produced uh, in Taiwan. So I think it's it's a multi-layer uh, question, right? First is within the car industry itself, with electric cars, and next step with driverless cars. Obviously, we're seeing the car itself becoming, as I said already, a, a animal of sorts, right, that can make its own decisions uh, in many different cases. Like for example, in Tesla, in many of the roads, it's already on autopilot. And that of course requires a lot of very interesting innovations in peripherals, in sensing and so on, that Taiwan really has a pretty strong position in. So I think it, it really is a, a golden opportunity, as you put it, for innovators in Taiwan's electronic and peripheral space, because the car becomes a computer, and just like computers, cars are going to be personalized and to be evolved in very different directions. And all this provides a golden chance for people who are good at innovating electronics, if not the entire car. Of course, for the th uh, form factor of buses, like electric buses and things like that, we also have pretty good Taiwan teams uh, working on that. But I'm not a industry analyst. I don't really know uh, if like three years from now, in which form factor will Taiwan company thrive, and which form factor it will be overtaken. I am not, I rely on industry analysts to provide me that opi uh, opinion. But I think from where I, I stand, Taiwan is really um, embracing this kind of um, opportunities. There are many regional governments already, like the Taipei city and the Kaohsiung city, and now in Shaolin, right? People really have go all in um, uh, demonstrating that electric cars, electric scooters, electric buses, self-driving buses, and things like that uh, on the bus lane in the midnight in Taipei, right? <laughs> all, all, all integrating in one way or another into the regional government. And I think as uh, someone in the national government, I think our role is not to point to specific industries and say, these things should thrive. Because we're not better innovators than people in the private sector. What we should do is that we should become learners. It's like what I said about Pokemon. It's the older generation and the younger generation both facing something unexpected, surprising, that nobody has any experience about. Which is why uh, next week in the parliament we will be talking about a financial sandbox uh, law that is finally being deliberated by the parliament where we ask people who are into the blockchain, into Bitcoin, and so on, 
to invent ways, to, new ways to do banking, new ways to do insurance, and so on, to declare their experiments, and for the government to work with the private sector innovators for six months or 12 months without putting a fine on them for violating the current regulations. Now, if their experiments prove successful, then we will change the regulation because we know the society is ready for it. On the other hand, if it's unsuccessful, the society finds it's a bad idea. At least it paid the you know, expense of research for everybody else. So like Thomas Edison, the other experimenter will now start from where they failed and make better ideas for the society. So in this way, instead of being regulators, we're now more like co-learners with the private sector on this kind of fintech. And if that passed uh, and we see some good experiments, we're now looking to apply this also to driverless vehicles. It may be uh, drones, it may be flying, you know, uh, quadcopters uh, that um, carries the uh, shipments, right? Like Amazon or Google is already testing using this kind of drones to, to carry, basically to serve as shipment carriers or as the regional city are experimenting with electric uh, automated cars in selected regions. But the point is that instead of to say, you know, the entire society need to work with this company or that company, we have a company proposing an experiment from their research lab. They said they are ready to work with the society and we work on them on a smaller zone and with the regional government support and we look at it for a while and see whether it's a good idea. If it's a good idea, we can change the regulation without fearing the society's rejection because the society is already ready for it. So I think the whole idea is for the government to co-create regulation with the private sector. And I think once we adopt this, then maybe it still takes four years or five years for the uh, electric driverless industry to mature. But at least the government will be seen as a fellow, as a partner uh, on its way to maturity, instead of being blamed, sometimes without very good reason, as a blocker <laughs> to their maturity. I think really the public service position is changing uh, in relation to the industry. And I, I think that's my, my uh, take so far. But thank you, that's a really good question. Any other questions? Thank you, Commissioner Tom. Uh, my question is about AR application and VR application. Sorry, uh, I'm wondering if any uh, a, a VR has been used in medical science or medical treatment. Are there some, uh, some uh, doctors use VR to uh, practice their skill about the like surgeon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and also. My another question is a, a philosophy one. How can we treat VR and also artificial intelligence? We, we can treat it as a product or machine for people. So. Well, that's, that's a great question. Um, I, I actually have a, a ready answer for that in the form of a prayer uh, just, just before I entered the cabinet. I was in New Zealand uh, at that time. and. Um, so, so that, that's my, my prayer. It should come up in a minute or so. Um, yeah, here. Right. So um, it's basically saying that uh, technology need to be social. It need to be working for the social goods instead of demanding the society to work according to technology because that's what we call technocracy meaning the technology dictating how the society need to operate. And this is basically almost always leaving people behind. So to your second question, instead of treating uh, specific technologies as people, we can treat them as what we call social objects, meaning that it's something around which the society can have a conversation. Um, I usually use the uh, metaphor of law for example, not many people need to be uh, lawmakers or MPs, but we do have professional lawyers, professional judges who work on law full time. But 
much more interestingly and importantly, is for everybody in the society to know something about law, something about the basic rights under law, something about the equality of treatment, the human rights, and things like that. And gradually have the paralegals, have people who know a little bit more to disseminate the knowledge and all the way on the literacy chain, all the way to the Supreme Court judges. And it is a healthy society if with any technology uh, or law, instead of just people knowing nothing about it and a small crop of people knowing too much about it, we have this slope where people, every place on the ladder can ask people upper level what this really means. So it forms a learning relationship. So it's the same with artificial intelligence. Why, why, um, why do I uh, consider AI something that is co-domesticating the human society? It's because um, algorithm or code is really not something that's magical. But just like uh, law, many people at the moment think it's something that's very hard to understand. But the basic context concepts are really simple. So, which is why we're integrating this uh, literacy into the new K-12 curriculum for the primary and secondary education level. Because we think only with um, the idea of people knowing something and knowing people who know a little bit more can we treat this as a social object that the whole society can have an intelligent conversation on. I also use sometimes the metaphor of fire because Fire was one of the original technologies, right? It was invented uh, to solve. Also, instead of taking part of our brain, cognitive function out, it's taking something from our stomach, our uh, digestive function, right? It breaks food down to smaller molecules. It makes people healthier because instead of just digesting one meal at a time, you can cook many meal and then uh, you know get those foods. Uh, moved instead of having to finish it off one meal. And, but fire is also very dangerous. If in a society only a few people know how to use fire, everybody can misuse fire and destroy the whole cities, really. It's a dangerous technology. But instead of saying, you know, we have to put protections around fire, we built a culture where we learn to cook, basically to use fire, very early on. And along with it, the cautionary uh, tales about fire and so on ever since when we were children. So I think to have a general literacy about AI and about related technologies is important, but even more important is the society stays at a place where there's always unafraid of asking somebody who knows just a little bit more than you and to get a, a supportive group. So this is what we mean by collaborative learning and about the human experience instead of uh, user experience. And so where people think the technology is leading uh, the humanity to one single destination, I always try to remind people that we actually, each of us, uh, is a different dimension on a possible future. And this is what we mean by plurality, is basically meaning we treat all those new technologies just as excuses for us to know each other more. And I think that's a much more healthier attitude when we're facing with um, new technology. And medically, uh, I, I might add, instead of uh, just uh, surgeons and, and so on, um, there's uh, psychological uses as well. Um, I think it's called wise mind or something. Um, it's one of those VR companies um, that's started by, I think, someone from Taiwan as well. Um, and it's basically doing uh, therapy for people who are paralyzed, uh, for example, from the waist down or from the left side or whatever. And so say if uh, you suffer from a, a slight, uh, I don't know, stroke or whatever, that disable one side of the body. And I tried it myself in VR. It's basically putting on the, the uh, helmet and asking you to use your right hand side uh, to manipulate those objects. But in the VR, on the mirror mode, you see your left hand moving. And then once I do that, I feel a tingle in my left hand because it's the brain trying to rebuild the neural pathway to the now disabled uh, left hand. And they've been working uh, pretty well with the hospitals and so on to try to uh, make this into not just 
fighting um, paralyzation, but also depression and other uh, mental or what we call uh, somatic as well as um, psychological issues. And so that's one of the things that really only can be done in VR because otherwise you can't convince a uh, person's brain that their left hand or their feet uh, paralyzed is now uh, working well and for the brain to rebuild the neural pathways. So I think that's also one of the very promising uses for medical technology in VR. Any other thoughts? Uh, there's two examples. Uh, excuse me. As we know, if we, if we take airplane frequency, Frequently, it will suffer more radiant exposure. And if we use uh, AI in a wrong way, um, such as hacker, um, it will be it will be risk for human. And is it possible that um, we use we use VR in a wrong way and bring risk for human? And uh, how long? Uh, it, it, is it safe for human to wear VR device? And is um, it is it is possible to suffer harmful elements by wearing VR device? Yeah, uh, VR actually was invented many many years ago. I think it was already available in the 80s. And the main reason why it did not get popular was exactly as you said. It's called VR sickness. People use VR for a, a while and then they feel that their body is not moving with what the brain thinks they are in and the people gets, get really sick. So um, one of the reasons why VR is taking off right now is because there's some very fundamental theoretical problems that's being solved to make people feel better. But it, with the current generation of technology, usually we just sit on a chair, uh, preferably a rotating chair and without moving too much. Uh, and if you are moving the VR world, but not in the real world, it helps in the VR world to paint uh, a car or some other vehicle so that the brain doesn't feel a disconnectedness. And the other thing is that sometimes it helps to paint a nose in the VR, that if you look down, you see your own nose uh, instead of uh, nothing, which also tend to make some people feel sick. There's some very uh, interesting research going on on the safe uses of VR, but usually we don't use it uh, like for stepping into each other's shoes or for sort of first and experience. We don't use it for more than at most half an hour. Uh, and at that point, and without a lot of moving, we consider it generally safe. But if inside VR, at any point, you feel um, you know, unwell or so on, just take the helmet off. It's, it's not worth it uh, to, to ruin your own uh, experience in VR, because then afterwards, you will tend to associate this bad feeling with the, the VR experience. So I think this, the health hazard really is one of the issues why VR hasn't taken off like, completely at the moment. And it's also why for production use of like face-to-face uh, -face meeting and so on, mixed reality classes, where you still see the classroom, but with additional people, right? So uh, that kind of um, idea, like um, what we call the yin-yang eye in, in here, right? Instead of uh, I don't even know how to translate that. <laughs> uh, like uh, visiting the afterworld. Um, yeah, so, so basically, as long as you still have some connection to reality, that actually makes the sickness uh, situation much better. Which is also why, personally, I insist um, in VR only visit or to have experiences that I conceivably can also have in reality. So it's okay to put on a helmet and go to the moon because physically it's possible for me to go to the moon. It's okay to put on it and visit some remote island like Penghu or whatever because physically it's, it's okay for me to, to go there. It's just much more expensive. But I draw the line at not actually go to somewhere that's entirely imagined, that has no connection to reality. But that's my personal view. I am not trying to enforce it to any other people. And there was a question there. Minister. My question is uh, how to free up the, the education of AI for in preschool for our children? And the other question is 
how to understand what is so called uh, the system of democratic deliberation is it? Thank you, sir. Uh, sorry, but I didn't quite get it. The first is that how to make AI education more accessible for, for students. Is that the question? Free school for our children. Free school for our children. Free school. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, and uh, second was about. Sorry, I really didn't quite get that. How to understand the, the system of democratic the system of democratic deliberation easy easily ah yes. yeah, that's the word that I missed okay um, so for grade school children I think one of the easiest way uh, to get some idea of how how AI works is through um, toys really through interactive forms. Um, there's a generation of young people at the moment um, brought up with Siri, which I also work with uh, when I work with Apple. Uh, and it gives a pretty good uh, idea of what the limitation, as well as the inner workings of AI. The children um, growing up with Siri very quickly discover that it's not human. <laughs> but, but then it's not stupid either. It's a different kind of intelligence that knows a lot of factual things. but pretty shallow about anything that requires long-term thinking, basically the one-second rule. So um, this kind of uh, first-hand experience with the AI agent, of course, helps. Um, the other thing that I would uh, recommend uh, if one is interested in uh, working AI in a visual perspective um, is a lot of visualization courses online. Um, there's many uh, different visualization courses that is done by various AI teams that tries to make the inner working of the AI very easily explained by people uh, to, to understand it. I don't really have uh, time to go into the detail, but the idea is that people can much easier understand AI if one first have a direct uh, training experience with it and then flip to its inner working and see how it works. So um, there is a experiment. Um, uh, right. which I think is really helpful, called um, Teachable Machine. And so it uses a uh, analogy where the AI is like um, a, a student, and then you're a teacher. And you can teach the student to uh, pick the right color, like red or green or yellow, uh, by you using your webcam on the front of the camera, making faces. Uh, like when you're smiling, it's green. When you're pouting, it's red or something. It only takes like five minutes or so, but it takes uh, the idea of uh, reinforcement learning and supervised learning and so on, those very basic uh, aspect of AI in a very quick way. So if you have a uh, laptop or desktop computer, I would encourage you to, to play this game and very quickly get an idea of how uh, like AI training actually works in a very uh, easy way. Um, the second question was about how to easily learn the basic idea of deliberative democracy. Well, first, really, you, it, it's like uh, programming. The, the only way to really understand it is to participate in one. But to participate in one doesn't really take much. It just takes a bunch of time, a bunch of people with different uh, viewing angles, and a facilitator uh, who can capture people's ideas and draw them uh, somewhere. I usually play a um, very quick, like two and a half minutes uh, film at this point, so we may as well do it now. Um, can I play films here? Oh, I actually can. I just need the microphone set up. Okay, so here we go. It's called Shwarma and um, it illustrates the basic elements you need to set up in order to have a deliberative meeting, and uh, let's go with it. And it's a petition case 
on an actual case on the e-petition platform. Somebody actually petitioned it, uh, but the National Development Council kind of just rejected it. But we brought it back um, and uh, make a film out of it.
So, so that's the basic elements of uh, the deliberation that we run practically every uh, Friday uh, up to this point. We've run 20 something uh, collaboration meetings now. And collaboration here is different from cooperation in the sense that in a cooperation, usually people need to know each other first and then we work on something. But collaboration means people who have never met before and then nevertheless work on something that everybody can live with. So maybe nobody is perfectly happy with the result, but everybody has learned something and contributed something that they can bring back uh, to the wider community. So, uh, and for those cases, actually the, uh, the CAR, the Taiwan NCAP, it is actually now a national policy. It wasn't like that when the petition was uh, first proposed. Uh, the long-term um, project management bill is also now uh, something that NDC is very actively working with the petitioner community. The atropine is actually now uh, being manufactured in Taiwan, so we, we really did something. And for the uh, e for the text filing software, uh, oh, and uh, the fifth one, the the ACE class about the uh, junior high schools and the senior high schools. It's actually ruled by the Ministry of Education in that the school cannot um, force the students to go there uh, on the ACE class. And so the, the seventh, actually the petitioners know much more about design of uh, experience of filing text on a Mac or on non-Windows uh, computers than we do. So we end up working with them for like five different workshops and finally redesigning the text filing system for next year. So next year we will actually have a much better text filing software. So the whole point is that instead of seeing people who have something to protest as mobs or as people who don't understand policy, we see them as collaborators like the idea is that for us to translate the policy into something they understand, but we trust them to bring something to the table that we don't understand. We get to learn about this together. So this is how uh, we do things. And um, the, the whole methodology and so on is documented in PO.PW, which is this book uh, that we um, give for all the, PO, all the POs and uh, let them know how exactly to run this kind of meetings. Um, so yeah, feel free to, to consult PO.PW uh, for the methodology and, and stuff. Any other questions? Uh, yes? Question is, uh, uh, the mayor of the Taipei city government, Mr. Ke, is said that if you give the bananas, you just can hire the monkeys. Do you think whether the um, salary of uh, our public servant is reasonable or not? Thank you. Huh, that's a great question. I think he, 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 he said that in the context of the, the director of the Department of Information Technology, right, the DOIT, um, uh, Dr. Lee. And uh, I think at, at the time here, he really, uh, I would say, um, really put this comparison kind of out of context. Because for, for us, for, for people who specialize in IT, to work in the government, including me, I'm taking like one third of the salary that I get to get as a consultant, right? So for us, it's all a massive reduction in, in payment. But on the other hand, what we get paid is, is impact, right? Uh, when I work with Apple, of course, my thoughts, my inventions and whatever, they do get impact, but it's not direct. Right, we, we invent something, it gets adopted maybe by the market, maybe many years afterwards with a lot of different adjustments and iterations. But when working in public service on public policy, you get to using this kind of collaborative methods, meet with stakeholders and really solve their problem in a very direct way. There really is nothing that prevents you from solving their problem when you're working in a public service. And so, and so this kind of social impact, I think, is what draws uh, people like me from the IT world to the public service. Not We're not in it for money. If we're in it for money, we will never be here, right? So so, so I, I think sometimes paying um, to, to put salaries or comparison or, or whatever really um, isn't a very good indicator. What I think is a good indicator is working condition, is work satisfaction. 
and so on. And to be fair, my parents were very worried when I entered the cabinet because they thought a minister's working condition is really, really bad because the, the, the MPs, the media, and, and so on, the people don't really um, give, give the ministers a break, right? Anything that we uh, do is kind of magnified uh, by the media for everybody to see. But even in this kind of um, environment, still I, I count myself as a, a friend with the media because I uh, have all those meetings transcribed and I videotape pretty much everything and so on. So uh, the media all have a lot of raw material to work with and they learn to build on each other's work instead of trying to get exclusive interviews. And once I change the media relationship like this, generally I think the media really gives uh, me a pretty good working condition and generally trust the, the words I say. And when they occasionally get my messages wrong, well, I just go to the discussion board under their web page and just put a reply there myself, right? So, so I, I think this kind of bi-directional trust with the media, with the civil society, with the stakeholders is the key to make our own working condition better because then people tend not to mistrust you but think, okay, you're, although you're working in the government, you're still speaking human language, right? So I think this is something that really improves the human condition for me personally and also for all the public servants you saw in the film uh, who are seen by the petitioners as really friends to solve, who solve their problems, who teach them something, who bring their vague ideas into actually working policy ideas. So instead of the, the leadership getting all the credit, the hardworking public servants through collaboration also get a lot of credit by the people who participate in this kind of collaborative meetings. So I think um, these are the kind of uh, um, spiritual, I would even say cultural rewards that we get by working in the public service instead of bananas, instead of uh, salaries and money and whatever. So I think for recruitment, especially now after the pension reform, we need to focus on how this uh, amplifies the impact and amplifies uh, the whole working condition and appeal for people's basically uh, altruistic, charitable impulse uh, to work in the public service. I really believe that. Um, other questions? Yes. Richard Hong. Uh, my name is, is Cherry Wu. Uh, I enjoy your English, English speech so much. Um, I feel so honored to have this opportunity to listen to your uh, wonderful English speech tonight. I have two questions about your private uh, thinking. Have you, have you ever feel sad during your life? Uh, could you please share with us Sorry, have I ever felt sadness? What was that uh, the emotion you described? My, my English is so poor. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Sorry. No, 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 it's okay. So, how, did I ever feel what? It's okay, take your time. Uh, I think you, uh, every time I saw you, I I think you are a happy, um, happy, happy man. Sure. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty, pretty happy. I, uh, I, uh, I, I think you are, you for, you for faith. Professional uh, uh, field is so uh, is famous for us. I I am curious about your private uh, thinking. So I want to know: um, uh, Have you ever feel sad uh, during your life? How? <laughs> 
how would you deal with your uh, your sadness? Sadness. Yes. Okay. Sorry. No, but but you had two questions. So what was the second question? Uh, uh, the first first question is: Have you ever feel sad? So how to deal with it? Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, that, that's great. That's great. That's two questions in one sentence. Um, yeah, I actually also have a video about that. I have a video for everything. Just a second. Um, let's see if I can find it. Though. Right. So um, yeah, uh, I when I was eight years old, I was really really sad. I actually cry every day and refused to go to school because there's a lot of bullying going on, and I was bullied pretty hard at the school and such that I quit school at the second uh, semester. And I actually haven't left in maybe the next two years after that until I was ten years old or something. So I was very depressed for for two years. Uh, but on the other hand, I think that really gives me some uh, perspective, and which is what the, this video is about. So let's play it. Okay,可能被被打或者被打破之前这个觉得世界是某个样子的，但是反而因为这种呃受创伤的经验，其实你的心灵必须要去接触到一些以前没有接触到的角落。那接触到之后，如果你又回得来，那这个回得来的过程就
VR incidentally also helps. In a VR uh, world, when I put on the goggles and go to the moon and look at the Earth from the moon, uh, suddenly it, it, it's, you know, there's no geographic boundaries. Everything seems so small and so trivial. And, and, and so um, it's like watching at yourself uh, from a large distance away. It's called the overview effect. And it, uh, with the help of VR, instead of five minutes, maybe I would just take you know, five seconds <laughs> to get into a state of a, a proper distance uh, from the emotion. So basically, just take a break when your body tells you to, because if you delay too much, then uh, that feeling becomes a trauma. But, but once you have a trauma, uh, it's also important to put every stage of trauma, put a name on it, so that once you get out, it's like walking out of a maze or a labyrinth, you still remember the part of it. and the, uh, thing, as I said in the video, is that you can then use this knowledge, this wisdom, really, to help people who are trapped in similar pathways in the labyrinth. I hope that helps. Um, yeah, any, uh, there's one there and there's one here. Uh, so, two more questions, then sure. we will go back to slide. Sure. Okay. Uh, according uh, to today's news, uh, the Fair Trade Commission imposed a fine of approximately, approximately uh, 23.4 Taiwan uh, billion on uh, Qualcomm. And what do you think about this decision and its possible impact? I have no idea. <laughs> I just learned it from the news. Also, I haven't I haven't talked to to the analysts nor the Fair Trade Commission about it. So so at this point, I know exactly the same as you. I just uh, know of the ruling, and I intend on reading it up. But I currently don't even know the reason why it gets fine. I just I just read it on the news a couple hours ago. So so sorry that I can't provide more more answer. But I think it's generally a, a, a pretty good idea for, for the society to have a discussion like this uh, in public instead of uh, you know treating it as, as something um, so when I look at the media's angle on it I'm actually pretty happy with the media's coverage uh, people generally analyze it from the mainstream news not as a us versus them but a actual portrayal of Qualcomm's income its market conditions and so on so I'm pretty happy with the media treatment on that but I haven't read up very deeply on this sorry about it so there was a question here. My question is so short. First, are you a hiker? Yes. <laughs> Second, if hikers were uh, legally uh, encouraged to do something for the government, what's your point of view? Sure. Uh, I mean, a uh, hacker, um, in its original sense, uh, is just somebody who is very good and immerse themselves into a field. So if one say is a legal hacker or a law hacker, it means that somebody is really, really good at the very fine details of the law. Somebody may say they're a, a physics hacker or a chemistry hacker or a, uh, and so on. But nowadays, we associate hacker with cybersecurity hacker, right? Um, and it is, of course, also a valid use of the term hacker, because to be a cybersecurity hacker means that you immerse yourself with the domain of knowledge of cybersecurity and uh, know the system so well, you see what's wrong with the system and the uh, weakness in the system and how to uh, use the weakness. Now, in a hacker, uh, cybersecurity hacker scene, uh, there's so-called white hat hacker which I uh, already referred to, we hired those white hat hackers to work on our system and let us know where it's vulnerable. There's also black hack uh, hackers who are generally people who are selfish and use those uh, weakness for their own personal benefit instead of for the social good. But um, I, I'm not actually a cybersecurity hacker. I, I understand basic cybersecurity, but I'm not uh, that good to call myself or to be called by the cybersecurity community as a community as the cybersecurity hacker. I am, however, a hacker in its original sense, in the sense that I, when I go into the public service, I tend to see the public service system as a system of communications. 
and the, how it's hierarchical organization, how it's uh, communicating with the outside, how the inside is um, collaborating or not collaborating for that matter across agencies and so on. So I see that as a system of public administration. But because I'm not a black hat or a white hat hacker, I, I'm not trying to um, repair the system and I'm not trying to exploit the system for my own gain. What I'm doing is I'm trying to create a new system, a, a parallel system that works with, with the government, but it's not work inside the government. It's basically a new communication uh, methodology for the uh, government to communicate with the people, with the civil society, that is based not on top-down or bottom-up, which is very hierarchical, right? It's called peer-to-peer -peer governance. So this is the system I'm trying to create, along with the help of people in front of um, cyber, uh, sorry, the public service in the cyberspace, but it really has nothing uh, to do with cybersecurity, uh, except insofar that we depend on a secure system as our uh, technological fundamentals uh, to run those systems. So uh, I think that uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president, said that um, no matter which field the hacker is, the, there's one commonality. Uh, hackers uh, like free sharing of information and dislike uh, like uh, hierarchical systems where people have to listen to somebody else without a very good reason, right? So I think uh, what I'm trying to bring to the public service is just for the public service to treat the citizens as equals. And I think uh, that's the main contribution I can make. But I also understand that this uh, belief or this system may not work uh, for cases like uh, the Ministry of Defense or the, the Ministry of um, you know, foreign affairs in, in some parts, right, and, and, and so on. So I'm not trying to blindly say, you know, everybody be friends. Uh, we know the real world doesn't work like this, but for specific cases like the ones I show in the film, it is possible for all the stakeholders to be friends at, at the end of it. So that's my contribution as a hacker to try to um, not use hierarchies when it doesn't make sense. I hope that answered your question. All right, uh, well, there's many more questions, so, um, how, how do we balance? Um, let, let's see. Um, why, why don't I just um, handle the questions that more than uh, one likes here, like quickly, and then we go back to the, um, okay. And I, I will be quick. So <laughs> Eddie asks, is Facebook really more effective for more likes? No. Uh, it, it, um, if you want to get your messages across, the metric to, to look at is the metric of shares, that's the primary indicator, and then comments, and then likes. Likes really doesn't mean much, right? But, but uh, how to make a message go viral, meaning that people want to share it, it all depends on whether in the initial six seconds you can engage them emotionally and let them think, oh, this has something to do with me. And that's the basis of the message. So that's the basic idea to get people sharing your message. Is long distance learning better than traditional class or not? I think it's not either or. Long distance learning is great if you need time of, for yourself to absorb uh, the message. For example, uh, someone who founded the uh, Khan Academy, Khan Xue Yuan, said that he tried to teach his cousins mathematics, but his cousin prefers the YouTube version of his teaching because in real life they cannot pause or rewind their cousin. But with their recording, they can pause and rewind many times over. So for that kind of knowledge transfer, obviously long distance is much better because they can learn at their own pace. But if they need to create something together as a team, then at some point, face-to-face -face team building will be useful, uh, or virtual reality face-to-face -face team building will be useful. So there is a time for cooperation and there is a time for long distance collaboration. Many young people complain about low salary, but they're not working harder or learning more. How can we help them? Well, for, for one, uh, maybe in many fields, it, it doesn't really pay to work harder because um, the really difficult hard work, like manual work and some uh, redundant work, right, it is more and more being automated. So for young people, it actually pays more to work smarter and try to offload the work, crowdsource the work, or have the machine do the work. But all this requires learning, right? And 
for me, I think what really um, for an adult uh, is to learn together uh, with the young people. As I said uh, in the Pokemon case, whenever there is something new and they don't feel alone in exploring and learning, uh, when they feel there is someone who learns alongside them uh, to explore different uh, angles and looking at the same thing, that encourages learning very much so. And also because if one is learning alone, it's very hard to make a commitment to oneself that we follow a day by day. But when we have two or more people along the way, then any any time I slack off or something, you can remind me by just you know working on it some more. So to have the same direction and learn together, I think that is the most effective way. Do you think there is little international news on TV in Taiwan and how to solve it? I, I think one of the least qualified person because uh, for more than 10 years I've not watched TV. I don't even know what the TV is playing uh, <laughs> at the moment or, or a, a few years ago. I, I've completely tuned out of TV so I, I'm I'm not qualified to answer this question. Um, I, I get all my news from my friends, from the uh, curated uh, internet websites like Hacker News and so on, by people sharing uh, interesting information and having a conversation about it. For me, internet is this uh, large conversation where I can join any time, and TV being very one-directional, I cannot have a conversation with people in the screen. For me, this really doesn't work as a medium of learning. So I really don't know. And for, for that matter, uh, the people I have a conversation with are pretty international in nature. Most of my best friends are not in Taiwan, so uh, I really don't have a good perspective to answer that question. I'm sorry. Um, Ivana would like to know how to use VR in government operation. At this point, most as a point to inform uh, the participants. But in the next maybe uh, one year or two years, also as a way to communicate over long distance. So it's pretty practical. I really use it every time. Um, Tanyan said, uh, what, what about soft skills? This is actually a great question. I'm, I'm um, afraid I don't have a lot of time to go into the details. But I found that in VR, uh, it's very easy to take somebody else's point of view. And this is great for management uh, purposes. If you can see a situation from every participant's point of view, it builds a kind of emotional bound uh, bind, binding to everybody in the room, but seeing the same situation but from different perspective. And this kind of empathy, I think, is the core of soft skill. And VR really helps uh, to build this kind of skill. Do you think the government's uh, infrastructure plan is a good plan? What's your opinion for this plan? I, I reviewed uh, part of the digital part of the infrastructure plan. I have no um, involvement in the other parts. Uh, I think the communication really could have done better uh, during the initial uh, phase of planning. But afterwards, uh, we did get some frequently asked questions and so on. There's a website for that at qa.pdis.tw. Um, and I think the communication strategy uh, around this Q&A system is one of the main things that I learned uh, because all the different ministries can use this system to collaboratively answer questions that they had to answer individually to each and every MP. But now with this system, they can just answer it once uh, and have it quoted everywhere uh, on, online on the internet and so on. And so I think this is one of the lessons we learned, is that the earlier, the better. And um, the, uh, the initial version of this used very um, professional language. But we have learned that if you have a frequently asked question, it's best to just have the people on the streets language as the questions, because that creates the relation. Uh, for them to feel, oh yes, I asked that. And then they will want to click through and read what we have to say on this uh, regard. So the, it's called infra.pdis.tw. That's one of the projects uh, that we have worked on during the infrastructure plan planning period. Um, what's the next core industry of Taiwan? I expect to be surprised. <laughs> uh, as I said, um, the, the whole point of having the sandbox laws and so on is to have innovations happen without us predicting it. So I expect to be surprised by people who feel entirely 
different fields together to create new fields or to, to invent things that beyond our imaginations and become Taiwan's next core industry. We're not in a position to point at the private sector and say, hey, you become the next core industry. We do know, of course, that Taiwan needs something uh, to solve the aging population issue, to solve the energy issue, to solve a lot of environmental issues and so on, but that is that core opportunities as of what industry actually solves these issues better, we are open to the, the private sector and the civil society to decide. According to your experience, what's the biggest difference between a private enterprise and working in the governmental sectors? Well, I think I, I feel liberated by not having to think about my employer's profit and the social good in the same time. When I work in the private sector, I of course work with companies who have a very solid corporate social responsibility plan, a social mission even, and so on. But still, it is a balance between the, the profit motive and the social good motive, even for the best social enterprises. But now in the public sector, it's entirely for the, for the social good. So all my um, behaviors, for example, when I work in the private sector, I abandon all my copyright and allow people to just freely use my work because I want my work to be in the commons for people to use. But for my employers, this seems very strange. But now I'm in the public service, this is the default. Uh, everybody expects the government agencies to allow the people to use our work. And so I think culturally it is a much better fit for me anyway to work uh, in the public service. So we did actually answer that about the harmfulness. I have no idea about the North Korea and the USA situation. I do know that it doesn't seem to be escalating too much um, if you just look at the social media. But again, if there is confidential information, I really don't have access to it. I just, you know, as you are, uh, read from the internet news. Um, so what about the harmful, like the AI robots? Uh, designed to be a killing machine. Who can stop it? Well, other killing machines, obviously. And or if it's designed to be a sex partner, uh, can can it get married? Is of a great impact. I agree, it's of a great impact. And uh, again, I think as long as the whole society has a first-hand or second-hand experience about it, we can come to a collective conclusion of what the society to do with new technology. It's not the point for an minister to decide for the society, but for the minister to make sure the society have a informed discussion. How uh, can you introduce how to use Slido.com? Well, it's, it's actually really simple. Just go to Slido.com and then click this new create event. It's a green button. Uh, yeah, the plus here, and then sign in with your Gmail account or whatever, and then um, pick a date, and then you're in. So, so that's 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 it. Uh, it's really this simple. So, um, and it's free of charge uh, for the matter. So, I think it's really easy, just to choose a date, to enter an event name, and then now you have an event where you can share with your audience. It's really really easy. Uh, I have no experience about television, sorry about that. Um, so depriving human jobs. So, so this is one of the core questions people are asking about AI, and all this depends on how democratic AI is. If everybody, including students, have access to fast internet and AI technology, it will be used to enrich, to improve the working condition of everybody. But on the other hand, if it's not open and it's only controlled by a small amount of people, and many people don't have connection either in internet or in uh, technology, then it would be used as a way to essentially enhance slavery. And in Taiwan, I think we're one of the very fortunate places where we get to say internet is a basic human right, and even have uh, the infrastructure plan pay for the last few percentage of people who don't have broadband access and who have access to AI computing. So I really think we are one of the places who can really democratize AI and see its effect on the society as a whole instead of concentrating on one or two people. Learning code is better, according to Tim Cook, than learning English is the second language. 
but I think a lot of the code is in English anyway, so this is kind of <laughs> a moot point. If you learn programming language, you will pick up English along the way. So, um, so I think maybe it's because of that that Tim Cook says it. Um, I think it is a good excuse to learn English as any excuse. On the topic of languages, do you think we should pay attention to the proportion of vernacular speech and classical texts on our children's textbooks? I, I used to work in the curriculum development committee, actually, uh, of K-12 on this very regard. And because of radical transparency, everything I said about this matter when we're debating it is online. The only thing I said about this is that uh, I think Wen Yin actually doesn't have to mean classical Wu Yin. It just means something that cannot be pronounced. It's right, written only language. And I think a lot of the symbols at, at, a, at this point of the, the emojis, uh, right, like this or whatever, uh, are, are actually write only language that are not expected to be pronounced. So I think they are Wen Yin uh, in, in today's day. And then I do think they should count toward the, the curriculum to elicit students' interest. Uh, my suggestion, I think, did not make it to the curriculum, but it is the only thing that I've ever said about this particular topic. Why Jukir is not as popular as Line? That makes me feel upset. Well, I, I'm sorry. Maybe you would like to put on some music and some tea. Uh, but at, at the end, this is about user experience. It's about the design, whether it makes people feel comfortable, safe, and happy using it, really. Now, for all the shortcoming of Line, it really is a better experience than Jukir. I've used both extensively. So, if Jukra works on user experience, at some point maybe it will get people uh, migrating from line. But that's, that's really the, the core issue here. It is not something that the government can point and say. It really needs a proper number of designers to make the user experience better. We did talk about VR technology and about the global and localization at the same time. There really is no difference of global and local once you are in the open source community, in the internet community, in the commons. So I think it really requires a change of perspective, like uh, even people who are very physically far away get to be felt like neighbors in this kind of community. I would encourage people to participate in perhaps the Wikipedia community or many of those international communities that embodies, I think, the spirit of globalization. How do you think about the policy of labor leave? I have no idea about the policy of labor leave. Um, uh, I, I do think that when I talk, uh, deliberated the national travel card, um, the, the issue, uh, it, the, the name of the national travel card really, um, in my personal opinion, need to be better described as a like forced taking labor leave and partially compensating for it on specific purpose card. Um, but uh, I think that particular poll did not really go over 50% among all public servants, so we are still calling it national travel card next year. But uh, maybe with some organized um, you know, work, we can improve the experience of using the national travel card. Um, what kind of jobs will be replaced by AI in the future? Basically, all the jobs that humans don't want to do. Uh, that's that's the, the, the answer. Because as human beings, as sometimes we, we take pride, we find joy in our creative work. And sometimes we feel like machines uh, just doing the work other people that require us to do. And for those work, uh, for those what we call machine machinized people, uh, this kind of people, you can't really compete with real machines doing chores like this, right? So all this will uh, eventually get automated somehow. So about uh, safety, uh, there is a, if you want to read up on it, uh, it it's called a value alignment problem. Um, how do we make sure that this new um, intelligence is aligned with us on the values. But in order to work on value alignment, we need to be very sure about our own values first. We need to put into words the ethical concerns that we have for each other. So it is an ongoing discussion, but I think it, we are making pretty good pro pro progress on this, uh, solving this problem. What about the agriculture, about speeding up the process of uh, informative environment in agriculture? 
Uh, I think in a lot of agricultural communities at the moment, they really use uh, the internet for a very good effect, from sharing how to use drones to <laughs> to take care of crop fields, uh, how to do selections, how to do logistics, how to make it a second uh, level processing instead of just the primary level, and so on. We see a lot of communities by social enterprises and co-ops and so on working in agriculture. So I think um, they really already have pretty good um, information um, knowledge communities, but I think for the um, um, like the older people or people who are more um, um, s separated from the information communities, this is why I uh, tour around Taiwan really every two weeks to all the different corners in Taiwan to work with social enterprises to try to get the latest social innovations anywhere in the world into the social enterprises that take care of the agricultural uh, communities uh, in Taiwan. That's part of my work as Minister taking care of social enterprise uh, policies. There's no auditor for the Ministry of Audit. How do we make sure that Ministry to, do, to work there in the right manner? I have no idea. I, I, I work in the executive yuan, you know, I'm not working in the corrective yuan. Uh, I, I have no idea how the auditing system itself is audited. Um, so if you have suggestions, I would encourage you to uh, come to the CY um, joint platform and let the people on the joint platform know. I'm sure there is one topic somewhere uh, where you can propose suggestions or ask questions for that matter. Um, how do you think uh, AI to uh, do you think AI will replace mankind to take care of the elderly in the future? Certainly, it will automate away all the parts that uh, the humans find it difficult to do. But for the emotional, like being there for elderly people, I think still think elderly people prefer people they know rather than virtual people that they don't know. But the, the virtual people there still can serve as assistance, right? Uh, for things like like really manual work that doesn't really require uh, an emotional connection. I think if the bed can flip itself, if the, the sheets can flip itself, and so on, of course there is a lot of assistive technology that we can use uh, thanks to machine learning to simplify work and also make the elderly more autonomous, more in control of their own life uh, instead of requiring people to help. And so the people are seen more and more not as uh, physical assistive helpers, but as emotional, just being there for the elders. And then the elders can make more contributions um, to the society with the help of such assistive technologies. So that's all the questions with more than one likes, and now we still have six minutes. So maybe we have room for maybe two questions. Uh, there was one there, right? And what, what's the other one? Okay, so let's... As we know, more and more younger generations uh, always see the phone in a classroom. Uh, what's your opinion or suggest to our stu student? Thank you. Right, so it's about students using phones in a classroom, um, which is exactly why I use Slido, is to take over their phones. Right, so, so um, it's impossible to compete against uh, the apps uh, like Line or Facebook or the games for attention because these are designed by really professional designers to, who want people's attention and will seize people's attention because I, I used to work on that. Um, and when we design this kind of thing, we, we kind of just designed for it to be the only uh, attention-seeking application. What we did not expect is that if you have more than three messengers or whatever apps that sends notifications, it creates a co cocktail effect in which the brain never finishes uh, processing one thing and then it gets interrupted and then the context gets fused into the next uh, notification and so the mind enters a place where it's not quite doing this and it's not quite doing that in a, in a state of betweenness and that makes the attention very partial, very thin and very hard to relate to, to real people. So, so really it is a mental health issue uh, that's being caused by mobile phones. So of course turning notifications off and turning it to silent not even vibrating, is my default mode. So if you call me, I never hear about it. But <laughs> I will listen to voice messages and call you back. But <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the other hand, I think it really requires a lot of self-discipline that we cannot trust 
even the teachers to have <laughs> in the classroom. So it helps to have a norm, a, a working uh, protocol of using the phone for something that contributes to the classroom. Now, Slido is an obvious form, but there are many Q&As and forums and other technologies uh, like the, uh, the Khan Academy that I described that can use the student's phones to good effect for letting the teacher know where the student is working on and so on. So I think it's essential for the teacher to think of the student's phones as an extension of their whiteboard. And if the teacher can get into the state, then the phone is there to help. Otherwise, I will really re uh, recommend uh, the teacher to take into account uh, the time for all the students to turn off notifications, switch to airplane mode, or whatever to minimize distraction, because otherwise it really degrades the quality. But students never like that, so which is why I use Slido most of the time. All right, uh, we still have three minutes. Any last question then? function is to uh, talking about this, uh, our government is short, is short of digital power. Yeah. So uh, could you explain digital power more for us? Okay, sure. Thank uh, you very much. Right. Um, yeah, the Taiwan Open Government Report is something that's uh, done by the community. But because of there's a public review uh, report uh, period, I actually also work, uh, work on it as a commentator. So, um, the chapter one, one uh, chapter two uh, in open government data. One of the key findings is that the civil search sh short of digital power and the system reform is much needed. Due to rich bureaucracy and obsolete information system, lack of coordination between government bodies, open data has been prevented from improving efficiency and become a heavy workload for civil servants. Right, so, so I actually completely agree with this problem statement. Open data in many other countries is designed uh, to improve communication and actually make the civil servants work less tedious. But in Taiwan, because of our KPI culture, when, when open data was first introduced, it's introduced as something that the civil service need to do in addition to the original work that we need to do. Right? So usually the open data is done in a track. But those data is just for the outside people to use. And it's not really used for cross-departmental uh, communication. It's not used for evidence-based decision-making. It's not really used to do something that simplifies uh, the civil service own work. So for many civil servants, open data becomes the synonym of more work, whereas it could be actually the synonym of less work or at least smarter work. So I think it really is a strategy of of our KPI orientation when open data policy was first done. So um, one of the, my, my first uh, moves as a digital minister is just to take out all the quantified uh, KPIs about data sets in the open data portal. I, I think that's really, it may have served an educational purpose when it was first introduced, but it grew more and more harmful uh, as time goes by. And I, I think I put a stop to it, but it's a little bit, a little bit late. So I think for many people, uh, when they think about open data, they don't think about it improving their workflow or simplifying their workflow. They think about, oh, there's one more KPI to fill. So I think once we can get this healing away from the public service, then we can talk about how to use data, but not as open data, but as a way to simplify our work by having people enter their information on one end and have all the different departments and all the different ministries able to access it in a useful manner. So the citizen doesn't have to fill in five forms and the civil service doesn't have to manually copy uh, numbers from like five different Excel spreadsheets uh, into a, a presentation as many people are doing uh, day after day to simplify and automate the work is the main idea. So which is why I don't really talk about open data much anymore. This is what we call data governance or data-driven policy making. If it works well and if we have a good um, data protection authority set up, 
uh, the NDFC is working on that, then it incidentally becomes open data. But open data should be a byproduct. It should not uh, be something that you work specifically for, but you don't use yourself. Because otherwise, it just gets what we call bit rotten, meaning that even bits, even information, gets rotten after, uh, like it's like flowers. If you don't water it, if you don't actually look at it every day, it just withers, right? So, so I think that's the main um, attitude we're taking about it. So, by digital power, I think this is not something mysterious or very abstract. It just means. If something that is digital, something is data instead of on a piece of paper, you can use it to power your work. Instead of, you know, it's being part of your deliverables while part of your KPIs, then that digital is not powering you. It's actually uh, depriving you of time and depriving you of power. I think that's the main um, idea that I'm going with here. Yeah, so that's it. Um, so there was, sorry, one, one question. If it's a short one, I, I'm sure we can still take that. Uh, how do you think about uh, VR shopping? Oh yeah, VR shopping. Um, I think um, e-commerce in general uh, benefits a lot if you can try it on, right? So uh, now we are looking at VR about trying out new buildings or new houses, but now we're also seeing like trying on new shoes or new apparels or whatever. But I think a lot of uh, experience will go to um, the purchasing of uh, experiences in itself. So it's not in VR, you look at some real consumer goods uh, before buying it, although of course that will happen. I think what we're, we will uh, look at is that we, people will pay for experience in VR itself, uh, curated and made specifically for them. It's like tourism, but uh, in a virtual planet or <laughs> in a virtual place uh, instead of uh, on Earth. But for that matter, I still prefer if the experience content comes from somewhere that's real, somewhere you can still visit afterwards instead of somewhere entirely synthetic. But that's, that's what I think will happen. All right, so that's it then. Uh, I'm sorry about the people, everybody else who asked on Slido and did not get enough votes. That's life. And uh, thank you for making it um, a such a rainy day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Tang. You answered a bunch, a bunch 